Amen, indeed. Turn in your Bibles one more time to Revelation chapter 21. While we do look forward next Sunday, Lord willing, to resume our study in the book of Matthew, it has been a great joy to have a little holiday break preparing for home, refocusing on that heavenly shore so we don't lose sight of our real destination on this temporary earthly layover. It's a message I've entitled, Finally Home. You could make this part two, Finally Home. I like the older commentator Newell, the way he puts it. We do well to return again and again to Revelation 21 and 22 because it is the end of the pilgrim path. The more distinct the vision to the Christian pilgrim of the beauty and glory of the city to which we are journeying, he says, the more just clearly we see it, the less the immediate environments of our journey will distract us or concern us. We have the end in view. The future awaiting us. The rest God has promised to us. In C.S. Lewis's final volume of his Narnia series, The Last battle. He includes a biblical vision and includes in his Christian allegory a pretty clear analogy of how the new heavens and new earth will compare to this old earth. Lucy is there and she thinks that Narnia has just been destroyed forever. She's grieving and mourning. She's pouring out the tears. And and then Jewel, the the unicorn, is also grieving and and sorrowful. And he says, Narnia was the the only world I've ever known. But we find out that they're actually on the threshold of Aslan's country, right? The the Lion of Judah he represents heaven and, and the eternal state. And what happens next as they look around at their new home? Lucy says, those hills, the, the nice woody ones, And the blue ones behind it, aren't they very like the southern border of Narnia? And yet, she says they're not like. They're they're different. They have more colors on them, and they look further away than I remembered, and they're more, more, oh, I don't know. They're more like the real thing, said Lord Diggory softly. And suddenly, Farsight, the eagle, spreads his wings. He soars 30, 40 feet up into the air. He circles around, and then he alights back on the ground. Kings and queens, he cried, we have all been blind. We're only beginning to see where we are. From up there, I have seen it all. Etten's Moor, Beaver's Dam, the Great River, Caraparavel, still shining on the edge of the Eastern Sea. Narnia is not dead. This is Narnia. And then as C.S. Lewis concludes, the difference between the old Narnia and the new Narnia was like that. The new one was a deeper country. Every rock and flower and blade of grass looked as if it meant more. He says, I can't describe it better than that. If you get there, you'll know what I mean. (laughs) Kind of appropriate here as we recognize the glories of some parts of this earthly world. What will those, the new world be like? And Lewis continues, he says, it was the unicorn who summed up what everyone was feeling. He stamped his right forehoof on the ground. He neighed and then he cried, I've come home at last. This is my real country. I belong here. This is the land I've been looking for all my life, though I never knew it until now. The reason why we love the old Narnia is because sometimes it looked a little bit like this. Scripture's clear, isn't it? Romans 8 and elsewhere, creation groans, creation will be restored, it must be remade. There will be continuity and yet discontinuity between this world and And that, best example, Jesus' body. Glorified, resurrected, deathless, uh, passing through walls, suddenly appearing up in Galilee, hundreds of k's away. Recognizable, yet new. Like our glorified bodies one day. Scripture tells us, there's a whole chapter, 1 Corinthians 15. Our renewed, remade, physical bodies, clothed with immortality, And glory, they'll be radically new, but still you. (laughs) And so it will be with this world when it's 
redone, the new heavens and the new earth. Second Peter chapter three, is this you, Christian? Don't turn there, but listen to how the posture and the perspective of the Christian is described. Second Peter three, verse 13. Would this be said about you and me, of all the other things that we're anticipating and looking forward to in life? It says, but according to his promise, we are looking for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, that's what it means to be a believer, a forward-looking people. Or as Isaac Watts put it so well poetically, there is a land of pure delight where saints' immortal reign. Infinite day excludes the night and pleasures banish pain. There, everlasting spring abides and never withering flowers Death like a narrow sea divides that heavenly land from ours. Oh, could we make our doubts remove those gloomy doubts that rise and see the Canaan that we love with unbeclouded eyes. That's our problem, isn't it? Our vision is clouded. Our perspective is blurry because we don't know our Bibles as we ought and dare to believe the future God has promised. And uh, the, the last verse, uh, Watts says, could we but climb, remember Mount Nebo, where Moses went but died and couldn't enter? Could we but climb where Moses stood and view the landscape or not Jordan's stream, not death's cold flood would fright us from the shore? Or as Matthew Henry put it, those that have the new Jerusalem in their eye have its map in their heart. <laughs> they know where they're headed and they know how to get there. Remember where we were last week, verses 1 through 8 in Revelation 21. We looked at the first seven stops on this guided tour of our eternal home, the sea, the city, the joy, the relief, the builder, the welcome, and the warning. We come now to verse 9 through 21, though I hope to cover a little further than that, at least in an extended sort of conclusion, and do the best I can in this little two-part mini-series to whet your appetite and renew your heavenly perspective or to woo and to win some of you who are not yet heaven-bound but in fact discover that you are still hell-bound. Let's read. Please stand as we hear the Word of God. Look in your Bibles from verse 9, Revelation 21. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone, as a stone of crystal clear jasper. It had a great and high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates 12 angels, and names were written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. There were three gates on the east, and three on the north, and three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its wall. The city is laid out as a square, and its length is as great as the width. And he measured the city with the rod, 1,500 miles. Its length and width and height are equal. And he measured its wall, 72 yards, according to human measurements, which are also angelic measurements. And the material of the wall was jasper, and the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundation stones of the city wall were adorned with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation stone was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald. Verse 20, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each one of the gates was a single pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold-like transparent glass. Our Father, we need your help to remove the fog in our hearts too often to cure us of our worldliness, to uproot us from our earth-bounded, earthly-minded, short-sighted, temporal perspective. Indeed, Lord, to stamp eternity on our eyeballs, to put more of heaven in us before we are in heaven. Forgive us, Lord, these descriptions we visit too often. We don't know and memorize them nearly as much or as well as we ought, but thank you for another opportunity to 
set our minds on things above where Christ is seated at your right hand, where we will be forever with the Lord, where our Christian loved ones and friends have already gone and where we will soon be much sooner than we think. May you, Holy Spirit, as you did for the Apostle John in one sense, so for us, take us there, carry us away, put us on that mountain as it were, show us the holy city, show us your bride, give us a greater hope in the midst of a hopeless and despairing world. In Christ's mighty name we pray. I ask all these things, amen. may be seated. In my Father's house there are many mansions, dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, Jesus said. I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Some of Jesus' final words in the upper room the night before he died, John 14. But you ask, where is that house? What is it like? Here's your answer. Revelation 21 and 22. The new Jerusalem, I believe, is the Father's house. God's abode where he lives with his people and where the very city he will bring down to the new heavens and new earth. The place where our names are written, where our our brothers and sisters are, our affections are, our hearts are, our treasure is, our inheritance dwells, where our citizenship is attached. You know how it is if you are planning to visit somewhere. We all have friends and family, probably in a country as troubled as this one, in a room this large. There's some of you considering immigration. Whether it's the massive decision of immigration or just the next big holiday that you have saved up for, you study that place, don't you? You examine it, you read about it. I remember once we were, uh, Michelle and I, and uh, we had little baby Evan (laughs) in our carrier, so a little little while ago, and uh, we were at a missions conference in England, and then we added a few extra days up at Edinburgh and St. Andrews, and another pastor friend here on the east side of Joburg was also excited to add a few days. So I said, great, we booked a place, and we planned it out, and he was single, and only after the missions conference on the subway, headed to Scotland, he says, can you believe we're going to be at the old course? And literally, I, I'm a basketball player, I don't do golf, I, I, I said, what's the old course? He's like... St. Andrews, the old course. And I was like, no, the whole reason for this trip is history. Do you understand? I've been spending months preparing Michelle and I. It's all about Edinburgh and the castle and St. Andrews and Knox and the Covenanters. Why else would you go to Scotland? And we laughed and smiled and said, great, I'll, I'll see you at breakfast and we'll go our separate way and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, maybe we'll meet for dinner. <laughs> it, it, When you're excited, you study, you prepare because of what that place means to you. Well, Scripture says here we don't have a lasting city. We're seeking the city that is to come. How much more we ought to study and examine and anticipate and contemplate and prepare ourselves for this whole new world of which the the crown jewel and the the paradise and the, the, the golden capital city of the new heavens and new earth is this glittering celestial city, the new Jerusalem, literally and truly heaven on earth. But notice verse 9 and 10. Before we come to our outline, notice how John introduces the scene. Verse 9, then one of the seven angels who had seven bowls full of seven last plagues came and spoke with me. So this was an angel who has been busy in the previous chapters announcing gloom and doom and terrifying bold judgments. But now a better and a brighter message. And he came and spoke with me, this mighty angel, and said, Come here, and I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. The wedding joy continues, right? You can't get a more glorious image. A city whose character comes from its occupants. A place known for its people. The eternal bride of Christ. The redeemed of all the ages. His church. Do you understand? A city with virgin beauty and virgin virtue and intimate relationship to the living God and the Lord Jesus Christ as we saw last time in verse 2 and now again in verse 9. We are his bride. Think about it, friends. The first Eden, paradise, was made for his image bearers. 
man and woman, because they resembled God, unlike any other creatures. The, the, the last paradise regained, the new world, is not only for us as human image bearers, but as redeemed sinners, his bride. How much more will he roll out the red carpet and extravagantly and elaborately delight us in this place he has prepared for us. Verse 10, keep reading. And John says, he carried me away in the Spirit, capital S, the Holy Spirit. It's a Spirit-led, spiritual journey like never before. And notice he is taken to the high and great mountain. And he's shown the city, the holy city Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Remember, he's on the desolate island of Patmos, but he is transported to the celestial city. He's on the highest earthly point where the angel could take him, as close to the, 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 the new Jerusalem as possible, suspended perhaps between earth and sky as he sees the city making his royal descent. It's, it's bridal march. Here comes the bride like you've never heard before. And we read of this city of divine origin built by God from all eternity, prepared to descend into the new heavens and the new earth, the ultimate mega city, a magnificent metropolis like the world has never known. Real estate agents will all tell you what sells property, what sells houses comes down to one thing, right? Location, location, location. Well, beat this. A brand new city in a whole new world with perfect climate and perfect conditions and a perfect economy. <laughs> I was telling Michelle this morning, it's a little odd to me that some dear brothers in Christ who were really caught up in some recent church growth methods in recent years were, and I, I, I kind of watched a few of them here in Johannesburg, and it was all about, and I'm not against hating the city, I'm all for loving your neighbor and, and seeking the good of the city for Christ. But it's a little ironic to me that some of the most vocal guys, we're down with Josie, we love Joburg, poof, gone. They're, they're all overseas now. Something tells me if you're focused more on the heavenly city, you might last longer in the earthly city. <laughs> Where are your hopes? Where are our joys? We live in this powerless, waterless <laughs> broken, corrupt city, and we have this gloriously stark contrast. Our outline now is five stops, five more stops, you could say, in verses 11 through 21, and then I hope to have a little time at the end to further delight and encourage you with a, a little extended conclusion. But let's, let's look at these five stops on John's guided tour, specifically here, of the New Jerusalem. If we're going to increase our anticipation and fix our hope and hunger and long more for the heavenly city, let's look first at her beauty and then her gates and then her walls and her dimensions and finally her materials. Five stops here. You learn a lot about a person by walking through their house, don't you? Have you ever had that experience? You thought you knew someone until you visited their house. You're like, oh, that's what's important or, or not important to you. Oh, now I understand you better, right? That's what makes you tick. That's what drives you or is important for you. How much more? God's home in heaven. His fingerprints are all over the place. His attributes are on display through all the artistry and through every feature. Let's look first of all, verse 11, at her beauty. Her beauty. Verse 11. We read, having the glory of God. We're going to pause and spend the next hundred sermons unpacking that phrase. <laughs> you cannot begin to fathom the unfathomable. The most distinguishing characteristic of the capital city of the new heavens and new earth. The full expression of the glory of God, manifest, unlimited, unconfined, flashing from that city into all eternity. God himself, the light of heaven and of its capital city, in all of his wonder and his majesty and the outshining of his character. Moses, Exodus 33, God says, no man can see my face and live. Moses says, I want to see you, show me your glory. God says, put a veil over your face, right? 
I'll let a little of my afterglow shine on you while you're tucked away in the cleft of that rock because you cannot see my full glory. But the rest of the Bible adds, no, not until heaven. No, not now, not yet. But on that day when at last we can see God and not die. Having the glory of God. Keep reading. Verse 11, her brilliance was like a very costly stone, as a stone of crystal clear jasper. Full heavenly weight and gravitas of the very magnificent glory of God shining out, not through ordinary glass like most of our globes and our light fixtures when we do have electricity. Uh, No, no, no. This is through a very expensive stone, ancient jasper. The equivalent to today's, do you know what would be the nearest equivalent in terms of gems? I had a lady after the first service visiting, and she says, I'm a part of a German gemology, uh, precious gems uh, club. And she just explained to me, I mean, of all Sundays, she's visiting here, and she starts telling me, fascinating things about what the original basis is and what the, 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 the core materials and all the details. And she was fascinated, as we ought to be. I don't need to tell you much about diamonds. This is South Africa, after all. But we all know that the clearer and purer they are, the more expensive. And the, the perfect gem is, is one with no blemish, right? No spot. Nothing flawless, uh, only perfect, crystal clear, refracted light. But, but notice, beloved, th- this is not a diamond with a light on it. Are you ready for this? It's a diamond with a light in it. <laughs> God's own, ineffable, perfect light, scattering his rainbow colors all over the new heavens and new earth. It's the ultimate light show. You've seen some of those, these high-felled lightning storms that we're blessed with. I love when people are visiting from other parts of the world. They don't get lightning like this. <laughs> Whoa! Uh, and even I remember once in Durban at one of our uh, church family's uh, beach home there, and we had one of those electrifying, <laughs> uh, almost terrifying light shows across the Indian Ocean. That will pale in significance to this radiating splendor of God, His divine beauty emanating everywhere, blazing, incomparable beauty. Her beauty, number two, her gates, verse 12 and 13. Her gates, keep reading. What do we see next there in verse 12? It had a great and a high wall with 12 gates. It's supposed to be an overwhelmingly impressive scene. We we, we must take it at face value. Heaven and the the new Jerusalem is not some amorphous, I'm afraid too many Christians have this mystical, nebulous, floating idea. No, it has dimensions. It has an outer wall. It has limits. You go in, you come out because it has gates. And praise God, at last, there will be perfect security. (laughs) unassailable, impenetrable. Not that there will even be any threats, but symbolically showing God's almighty, omnipotent, keeping power. What did Jesus promise? None shall snatch them from my hand. Nothing can separate us from his love. Of all the Father has given me, I've lost none of them. Keep reading verse 12. It has great and high wall, it has 12 gates, and at the gates stands St. Peter. Is that what it says? No. There goes all those corny jokes. Far better than that, we'll come back to Peter in a minute, far better than that is angelic messengers, divine spirit servants of the saints. Maybe they're there as guardians and keepers. They kept us safely out of the first Eden. Maybe they'll keep us safely in the new Jerusalem. Uh, Maybe it's just to say welcome home as angels are known to do when Stephen was martyred and elsewhere. Maybe both to welcome us in and welcome us out each time we travel throughout the new heavens and the new earth. The Bible says they exist to serve the saints. Keep reading verse 12. The gates, the angels, and then the names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. We just saw that in Psalm 87 this morning. God's not done with the Jews. 
the rich history of his promise to his chosen nation of Israel and his great redemption plan. Even heaven will have a Jewish flavor celebrating for all eternity his covenant faithful love to an undeserving people. Keep reading verse 13. There were three gates in the east and the north and the south and the west. Any Jewish reader or Christian who knows their Old Testament immediately should be thinking of the tabernacle of the Old Testament, right? Leviticus, Exodus, Numbers. To the north, to the south, to the east, to the west. Three tribes each revolving around what? The dwelling place of God. If you know Ezekiel's prophecy, chapter 48 of Ezekiel, in the millennial temple for a thousand years, again, it will center around this place of worship until, as we'll see at the end, there's no need for any temple anymore. But God is a God of order, Scripture tells us, right? Perfect symmetry, exact balance, precise order. A, a, a God who is the opposite of the chaotic art and music that is so celebrated in our debauched and confused and, 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 and foolish society. This is how the, the, the divine mind of a triune God operates. Alcorn, in his wonderful book on heaven, applies some sanctified imagination here. He says, each of these 12 gates may go out into a different country. You wonder why only humans of all the creatures have this wanderlust to travel, to explore, to see, to learn, to discover. He says, perhaps each of the gates goes in a different direction with a radically different terrain. Imagine people of every nationality and color and dress going in and out of the city, some leaving on a task, a mission, a project, an adventure, a banquet, a visit to friends or loved ones, and then coming back to talk about it. Hey, what'd you do today? Oh, I just swung by Pluto. Have a seat. I'll tell you about it. Whoa! <laughs> Meeting up, sharing stories. Heaven, a place of perfect friendship and harmonious relationships and complete trust and love. Number three, from her beauty to her gates to her walls. Verse 14, look at the text. The wall of the city had 12 foundation stones and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Maybe these massive stones are under each of the 12 gates, it seems. On top of the gate, you have the name of uh, each of the 12 tribes of Israel, and below you have an apostle's name. Okay, so Peter shows up, and so do the others. We can debate about the 12th another time. But you say, why? Why the apostles' names? If the tribe names on the gates celebrated his Old Testament covenants and the Jewish roots of our faith, surely this celebrates the new covenant relationship of Christ with his church. Tell me history doesn't matter to God, that history won't matter to us for all of eternity, looking back on God's saving plan in time and space and real history. Number four, after her beauty, her gates, her walls, we come to her dimensions. Verse 15 through 17, her dimensions. All the greatest world cities, pick your favorites. Tokyo, London, Sydney, Rio. Bay, uh, here we go, right? Sydney skyline. It's the only chance I'll ever get to do something on the stage of the Sydney Opera House, right? <laughs> All those places are squatter camps. They are pathetic villages compared to this colossal megapolis. Verse 15, the one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its wall. There's no budget constraints. You don't need any quantity surveyors. There's no cost estimates to worry about. When the measuring tape is made of gold, you get an idea of the budget. <laughs> a three-meter rod. Gold because it belongs to God, the owner of this piece of prime real estate property. And here's what he finds out. Verse 16. The city is laid out as a square. Get a grip of this, beloved. Its length is as great as its width, and he measured the city with the rod, 1,500 miles. Its length and width and height are equal, perfectly cubed, 2,200 Ks by 2,200 Ks by 2,200 Ks. You understand, that's starting Cape Town, that's past Joburg and Pretoria, that's past Polikwani and Musina, that's past Bulawayo, that's nearly 200 Ks further. It's almost to Harare from Cape Town. 
The way things are going lately, you, you never travel there without getting fined, robbed, bribed. <laughs> but, but that's not the point, right? <laughs> 2,200 Ks by 2,200 Ks by 2,200 Ks. Millions, in fact, of golden miles in every direction. First Kings chapter 6 must be in the backdrop here. The Holy of Holies and the Temple of Solomon. We read the inner sanctuary was 20 cubits in length and 20 cubits in width and 20 cubits in height. And he overlaid it with pure gold. Deja vu. Sounds familiar. Our future home, this heavenly city, is a gloriously, perfectly cubed city. Though much bigger and more spacious than Solomon ever knew. I love how Alcorn puts it. Grasp something of the enormity of this city by considering that this figure is 40 times the area of England, 20 times the surface of New Zealand, and 10 times that of Germany or France. The ground floor alone of the New Jerusalem provides enough living space for far more people than have ever lived in the history of the world. That's just the first floor. There might be many floors. <laughs> Multiple stories. Another 2,200 or 2,100 Ks of stories. A skyline vastly surpassing Hong Kong, Shanghai, you name it. Keep reading, verse 17. The vision continues, uh, and he measured its wall, 72 yards according to human measurements, which are also angelic measurements. Probably speaking of the thickness of the wall, some 70 meters thick, nearly as wide as a, as a rugby field. And then for the spiritualizers who think, well, it doesn't really mean what it says. There must be some deeper, mystical, allegorical meaning here. <laughs> he says, uh, human measurements, which are the same as angelic. Okay, there you go. Number five. What's the wall made out of, friends? We've seen her beauty, her gates, her walls, her dimensions. Notice now, verse 18 through 21, her materials. Her materials, the most decorated city in the universe, eclipsing all the wealthiest cities the world has ever known. Verse 18, the material of the wall was, there it is again, the ancient version of diamonds. One massive cube diamond, 2200 Ks in every direction, breathtakingly, mind-blowingly staggering. Keep reading, verse 18, and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. You say, well, I've never heard of that kind of gold. Exactly, because it didn't come from below. It's brought down from above. It's divinely, heavenly, translucent gold. Perhaps it's transparent and clear so God's glory can shine through it and not be blocked or obscured in any way. God's majesty radiating out in dazzling brilliance, flashing gold and diamonds. Some of you are thinking, hold on, I like my privacy. <laughs> I'm not sure about a city where everything is see-through. To which I say to you, you'll have nothing to hide. You'll have nothing to hide. Verse 19, keep reading. The foundation stones of the city wall were adorned with every kind of precious stone. First foundation stone was jasper. The second so we have Jasper, this radiant, white, crystal clear diamond, flashing uh, colors. And by the way, this is the breastplate of the high priest, if you know your Old Testament, Exodus 28, displaying God's glory, showing the high, unique calling of the priest in God's service, but now you have a whole city in the service of the Most High God. And eight of the 12 stones listed here are found on that priest's breastplate in the Old Testament. And maybe the other four were there as well. We don't know. So you have Jasper. And then keep reading on the list there in verse 19. You have second, Sapphire. This brilliant blue possibly flecked with gold. You have Chalcedony next. As far as we know, it's some kind of a gate stoned sky blue with translucent stripes of color. As we go through this list of gems, I'm afraid my, my sons, uh, when they were younger, I won't pick on, I don't even remember which one it was, but uh, picked up my level, very limited level of gem appreciation. And we were in Washington, D.C., uh, and the Smithsonian has a whole floor of, of uh, precious gems and different royalty uh, around the world. And I remember one of the boys just kind of like, you're supposed to study and examine things, but, you know, 
you can only handle so much, uh, m so many museums as a kid that dad can squeeze into one day. And so they just kind of strolled right through the gyms and they shouted out with Cantrell volume, uh, looked around and said, wow, this guy's really rich. <laughs> like, whoa, whoa, no, we're supposed to actually stop and, and ponder this. Number four, emerald. Keep reading there, that bright blazing green. And then sardonyx, a red and white kind of stone. And number six, we have sardius, a, a, a little more common kind of red quartz stone. And then chrysolites, this lucid, transparent, sort of goldish, yellowish stone. And then we have beryl, that rich, deep sea green. Ninth, we have topaz, this amazing, transparent, yellow green. And tenth, we have chrysoprase. Another transparent kind of apple green stone. And then we have jacinth, a pure glassy bluish smoke, violet colored stone. And the modern preacher says, how did the early church ever preach these things without PowerPoint? And to ask the question is to answer it, I'm afraid. God's word is its own best description and your own sanctified imagination. Number 12, amethyst, a brilliant purple. Are you starting to see, beloved, this heavenly city's stunning foundations, these, these fireworks of blazing color, this spectacular panoply of, of brilliance through which the light of God's glory shines, a God of infinite variety. Tell me our God doesn't believe in endless creativity and unbelievable beauty and indescribable splendor, untold wealth, all to display his beauty, his magnificence, in awe-inspiring wonder to all who behold it. Walls of jewels, foundations of jewels, also literal and yet symbolic of purity and durability. The only city in all of history that will last forever and ever. Let's apply this. Let's get real personal and practical. Alcorn tells of a Christian father who came to see him while still grieving the devastating Sudden and tragic loss of his teenage son who had been saved, praise God, and was his now his best friend. His boy loved the Lord. And this bereaved dad sat there and Pastor Alcorn said, excuse me, sir, but may I ask, what is that in your hand? And the father opened up his hand to show a beautiful reddish polished stone. He says to Pastor Alcorn, it's Jasper. With a smile, he says, it's a little thank you gift, Pastor Alcorn, for your teaching on heaven, showing us what the Bible says about eternal glory. He says, your teaching made heaven real for me and my wife. It has given us tremendous comfort and profound support. Now we live in the hope of living forever with our son in that glorious city with jasper walls. Keep reading verse 21. And the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each one of the gates was a single pearl. That must have been some oyster. <laughs> Pearls of God's own making. Like nothing this world has ever seen. Literally out of this world. Brought down from heaven's own vault. Each gate a single 2200K high pearl. Perhaps also here literal and yet marvelously symbolic. And like all the other precious metals and stones, pearls formed in oysters through injury and pain and loss, out of which comes beauty. Glory through suffering, a crown through a cross, a victory through defeat. Perhaps the pearly gates forever are to remind us of our wounded Redeemer, God's suffering servant who bought us at great cost. Keep reading verse 21. And the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. Every street dazzling with gold, blazing with his glory in every direction, on every avenue. All the roads in Jerusalem lead one way to display the glory of the Most High God, to intensify our worship, to increase our delight, to deepen our satisfaction in his very own presence. God himself is there. Every 
Walkway shouts his glory. Every path proclaims his beauty. Every road in the new Jerusalem sings his praise. When shall these eyes thy heaven-built walls and pearly gates behold thy bulwarks with salvation strong and streets of shining gold? Jerusalem, my happy home. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, Jesus taught us. Why live for this old fading world compared to heaven's imperishable riches? It doesn't get any better than this. Somebody said it well. The more of heaven we cherish, the less of earth we covet. Or someone else said, one minute in heaven and we'll be ashamed we ever grumbled. As Adib Pink put it, one breath of paradise will extinguish all the adverse winds of earth. Jerusalem the golden with milk and honey blessed, beneath your contemplation sink heart and voice oppressed. I know not, oh I know not what joys await us there, what radiance of glory, what bliss beyond compare. And I can't end without at least quickly giving you a closing taste of the contrasts. We've seen the five stops, her beauty, her gates, her walls, her dimensions, her materials. But watch where John goes next in the next few verses. He tells us what heaven won't and will have. Watch this. What will not be there and what will be there. Notice quickly, there are seven things that won't be there. First of all, there's no temple. Verse 22, I saw no temple in it. For the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. And then he says there's no sun or moon. Keep reading. And the city has no need of the sun, verse 23, or the moon to shine on it. Why? Because the glory of God has illumined it and its lamp is the Lamb. As we sing, the Lamb is all the glory there in Emmanuel's land. This will not be a solar system. It will be a savior system. Not centered around S-U-N, but centered around S-O-N. God the Son, Jesus the Lamb. Joel James has a free little booklet online I recommend to you. What will heaven be like? What will heaven be like? And he says, the Apostle John tells us of this cubed city of crystal diamond and see-through gold, a monumental city pulsating with an internal glow, internal glow of the very presence of God. He says, imagine a city that looks like an internally lit diamond the size of Australia. How appropriate. That's the capital city of heaven, and that's where you'll be living when Christ takes you home. No Eskom or Eshkom to worry about. No substations to wait for. No, perfect power only. Unlimited supply, endless light because God himself is light. Scripture tells us infinite light. In his light we see light. No temple, no sun, no moon. Get this, no racial division, no racial strife. Is there any other country in the world that more needs this hope and this vision than here in S.A.? so-called rainbow nation, where we barely pull it together for five minutes to sing a wonderful national anthem that was a Christian revival hymn, and then, you know, we lose the game. No, oh, sorry, that's a sore subject. <laughs> we, <laughs> but, but, but on a serious note, we, we, we quickly strive. We, we lose sight of this unity. We, we fight, we war, we divide, we hate. But, but not so on that day. Verse 24, the nations will walk by its light. Ethne, all the tongues and tribes and, and peoples and nations walking in heaven's light, redeemed by the blood of heaven's Son. Heaven is not limited to one group. There's no divisions. There's no discrimination. There's no partiality. There's no favorites. Everyone thinks of the old city in Jerusalem for the Jews. Not so in the new Jerusalem. Capital city for all and sundry. No past laws, no apartheid, no segregation, no racism whatsoever. In Christ, the wall forever is torn down and we are one. We are redeemed. And cultures are represented gloriously and beautifully with a real and a holy equality. Racial harmony like the world has never seen, but like the church should portray 
and give a foretaste of. Verse 24 continues, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, foreshadowed by the three wise men from the east, bringing to the Christ child their gold and frankincense and myrrh. Christ, imagine, will even save world rulers, dignitaries, presidents, prime ministers, politicians, nachol. All their power and authority came from God, so all the glory goes back to Him. Queens and kings bow prostrate, bring their finest gifts and their best tributes to the King of all kings and the Lord over all lords. And then keep reading. There's no temple, there's no sun or moon, there's no uh, uh, racial strife, there's no locks. Wow, let this sink in here in S.A. and in this dangerous Joburg. Verse 25, in the daytime, there'll be no night there. Its gates will never be closed. No need for security, no crime, no enemies, and no locked doors. What a glorious prospect indeed. A perfectly safe city. Keep reading, verse 26. And they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. Open for business. Unceasing trade in the new Jerusalem. Perpetual productivity in an uncursed, untiring, renewed earth. Keep reading. There's also no sinners there. Verse 27. And nothing unclean. And no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it. But only, is this you? Only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Open gates, but access denied. Doors barred. Entrance forbidden to unbelievers. Enemies of the Lamb will not be allowed in his city or country. They had their chance. They refused to repent. They wouldn't receive his free gift of salvation. They wouldn't drink of his water of life as we saw last time. Now it's too late. There's only one way to heaven. There's not two, there's not three, right? There's no shortcuts, there's no side paths, there's no back doors into the new Jerusalem. Your name must be written in the Lamb's book of life. You say, Tim, how do I know? The Bible tells you how. Repent, believe, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You can know. Come to Christ today and you'll find your name there after you have embraced Christ. Only then you discover you're one of God's elect by grace alone. But there's more. If you jump ahead to the next chapter, 22 verse 3, there's two more things that won't be there. Notice, thematically, Topically, what won't be there? We said no temple, no sun, no moon, no racial strife, no locks, no sinners. Notice, no curse. Verse 3, there will no longer be any curse. Revelation 22, verse 3. Oh, Adam, what hast thou done? We saw last week all the guilt and pain, the strife and struggle, the sorrow and death. No more when the last Adam returns. The ruin is reversed. The woes are over. There's no more curse. Notice also, one last thing, there'll be no more night. Look it up, that glorious song we love to sing. No more night. A nightless eternity of everlasting light. There will no longer be any night. The sun never sets on the new heavens and new earth because he is alive forevermore, seated on his throne Blazing in endless glory. And notice we won't need to sleep. The curse is lifted. Our bodies are glorified. It's a perpetual Sabbath of productive rest. Tirelessly serving our Lord. Continually refreshed in his presence. And so we end with what heaven will have. If that's what it won't have, I can't leave you without three magnificent positives that are given to us here in these opening verses of chapter 22. I like the words of good old J. Vernon McGee. The New Jerusalem, he says, will be dazzling in its appearance like a fabulous jewelry store. However, if there's no soft grass to sit upon, no green trees to enjoy, no water to drink or food to eat, taste, and savor, no, he says here, there is a rich softness added to the city of elaborate beauty. Look, notice the three positives, the river of life and the tree of life and the service of God forever. Look at how it begins. Verse, chapter 22, verse 1. He showed me a river of the water of life. Is this literal H2O? Is it, it literal and symbolic? Surely the water of life 
life in Christ, life forevermore, cascading waterfalls of splashing joy, bathing the new Jerusalem in more and more light and more and more life from the celestial river. The river of life and then the tree of life. Notice verse two, in the middle of its streets. On either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, The first tree of life we got banned from, right? Because of Adam's fall. The final tree of life we cannot ever lose. It seems like this throne of God and the Lamb stands at the head of the kind of main street of the New Jerusalem. And on either side of the main street seems to run this river of life. And this tree stands over it or somehow alongside it as the image of a fruitful tree surrounded by water. And every farmer's dream, 12 kinds of fruit. Uh, Imagine, fruit of the month, January through December. (laughs) Endless variety, flavor, taste. A gardener's paradise, the ultimate harvest. Notice also they are for healing. Verse 2 concludes, the leaves of the tree were for the healing, but there's no illness there. Nobody will be sick, but life and health and therapeutic wholeness and immortal shalom and never-ending well-being and supernatural vitamins (laughs) and uh, unlimited supply of vitamin B injections without the needle. Uh, uh, I don't know how else to describe this. It's as if the streets and the tree and the river and the leaves and the fruit are like happy Jews constantly toasting one another. Lechaim, lechaim, lechaim to life. And then finally, heaven will not only have a river of life, a tree of life, but the service and the enjoyment of God forever. How wrong it is Christians think, and typically non-believers will say, oh, you just sit on heaven plucking your harp and, you know, uh, uh, snoozing and sleeping and bored forever. Well, that's because they're bored with God and they don't know Christ. But the Bible also says that we will be busy serving him, right? Verse 3, his bondservants will serve him. And verse 4 goes on to say they will see his face. We spoke about last time. His name will be on their foreheads, not just the high priests on their turban anymore, but all of us as a priesthood and a kingdom of priests, sealed by his name, protected by his keeping power, never to be lost again. And verse five says, no night, no light, no lamp needed, we spoke about, because the Lord God will illumine them and they will reign. That's not just sitting and soaking, that's ruling and reigning and serving and working and producing and bearing fruit forever and ever. Both slaves and rulers For God in glory, kings and queens forever under Christ the Lord as his vice regents over a new world in all of its splendor. What heaven won't have, what heaven will have. Why would you not want to be there? I leave you with that. Join us. Shall the circle be unbroken? It was a dear father and grandfather after the first service. He says, my heart is so heavy. I have grandkids that don't know Christ. At this point, I won't see them in heaven. Never mind the horrors and the terrors and the outer darkness and the weeping and the gnashing of teeth and the eternal burning, flaming, scorching torment of the lake of fire where they will dwell forever. This is the only heaven they'll have. They have no idea what they're headed for and what they're missing out on. Why would they not join us? Why won't you be there? As many as received him, to them he gave the right to be called sons of God. Trust in the Lord Jesus today. The eternal home for the saved. What fool would choose hell? I'll tell you. I'll tell you exactly. The one who loves his sin so much, the one who loves her sin so much, she will pay the price of eternal torment because of it. My friend, you can hold on to hell if you want. I'll take heaven any day. And I want to see you there. I love the way that song puts it. Some ladies are preparing to sing this for us soon. But it's worth repeating. Last night I lay asleeping. There came a dream so fair. I stood in old Jerusalem beside the temple there. 
I heard the children singing, and ever as they sang, methought the voice of angels from heaven in answer rang. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, lift up your gates and sing. Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna to your king. And then methought my dream was changed. The streets no longer rang. Hushed were the glad hosannas, the little children sang. The sun grew dark with mystery. The, 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 the morn was cold and chill as a shadow of a cross arose upon a lonely hill. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, hark how the angels sing. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna to your king. And once again the scene was changed. And now there seemed to be, new earth there seemed to be. I saw the holy city beside the tideless sea. The light of God was on its streets. The gates were open wide. And all who would might enter. And no one was denied. No need of moon or stars by night or sun to shine by day. It was the new Jerusalem that would not pass away. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, sing for the night is o'er. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna forevermore. Please pray with me. Father, we do thank you for this hope that is ours. Forgive us for underestimating for not valuing it, uh, uh, for not treasuring it, and you and your presence, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who will be there. Fill us with more of these heavenly hopes that we might be of greater earthly usefulness to you and more, be more steadfast and immovable and fruitful for you in light of eternity, in light of our destiny, and remembering that we are but pilgrims and sojourners. This world is not our home. We are merely passing through in many ways, and we are not there yet, but we soon will be. Please, Lord, stamp eternity on our eyeballs. Teach us to live more this day in light of that day. Save any who are lost here amongst us who need not be hell-bound, but by your grace can repent and believe today. Call in the name of Christ. Be saved and join us in glory forevermore. For Christ's sake, we ask and pray it. Amen.